Uh, we're joined today by John Haas. He is our guest speaker for this morning on this very important topic on cybersecurity. And, you know, as you know, companies really of all sizes need to be aware of cybersecurity and how it can impact their business. And so John's going to be talking to us about the threats that are out there, you know, how to mitigate those risks, right, manage those risks, including insurance, and give us some simple tips that no matter the size of your business that you can start taking now to protect your company. Before we get into that, I just want to briefly share with you, for those of you who may be new to the SBDC, very quickly what we have to offer. Uh, we, are, uh, we do offer a confidential one-on-one -on -one business counseling at no cost to small businesses across our state. And you see the map there. You see we're low, we have 10 centers, SBDC centers across the state, as well as our Apex Accelerator sites that help small businesses with government contracting. Uh, but name it, we have a wide range of expertise that we can help you with, business plan development, if you're looking for capital, um, need some help with those finances, marketing, we offer um, export assistance, government contracting, veterans. Uh, just think of any business development area and we have experts in our state that can help you. So um, we'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation about how you can request our services, but we want to get in today um, to the, our cybersecurity topic. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. John Haas. He is the Prescott Regional Opportunity Foundation President and Chair of the Board. He comes to us with a wide range of experience, having uh, helped start up and work in uh, startup businesses in many different industries. He's the past department chair for cyber intelligence and security at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. And he was also appointed to Governor Ducey's cybersecurity team. So with that, John, I'll let you um, add to that um, introduction if you would like, and I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to you. And I will stop sharing my screen so that you can uh, bring yours up. Great. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Uh, this is a great opportunity to reach um, a big audience. Um, I, I'm excited to uh, see so many folks online. And um, I want to call out to the SBDC and the Apex Accelerators for their support and in inviting me to this. And it's part of the small business um, administration uh, in the United States. And I'm partially supported at the Center for the Future by the US Department of Agriculture a Rural Development Grant, which has been a really great thing because innovation and acceleration is part of the mission uh, for growing jobs and creating a great economy. And of course, Arizona has been doing a good job, and a lot of that is thanks to small business. Uh, that's where a lot of the job growth is. Um, while we were becoming a 501c3, the Prescott Chamber of Commerce Foundation acted as our fiscal sponsor. And today, um, we have a number of companies already incubating at the Center for the Future. Um, this year, I'm on sabbatical and have been traveling and giving presentations and talks and uh, writing papers. While I'm uh, not on full-time teaching, I'll go back in the fall uh, to the Cyber Intelligence and Security Degree Program at Embry-Riddle, where we are educating the next generation of cybersecurity warriors. And we hope that many of them will stay here in the state of Arizona to help uh, companies such as you that are online uh, listening today. So if you have a question, as we said, um, go ahead and put it in the chat. We're going to run a little poll in a little while, uh, but I wanted to kind of give you an outline of what we're going to talk about today. Um, I've already welcomed folks and thanks everyone again. Uh, talk about the threat landscape today in 2023. And of course, we'll look back one year because we're only three months into uh, 2023. We'll talk about the cybersecurity insurance marketplace, which has changed dramatically uh, in the last uh, three years and not surprising, uh, partly because of the pandemic. And some of these changes have impacted premiums as well as the solutions that small businesses can get. Insurers, um, because that's their business, are getting more picky 
about who they insure and how much it costs um, because they don't want to insure people that aren't doing their part. So we'll then also talk about what are the best practices for you as a small business to make sure that you're cyber resilient, whether you have insurance or not, and because you can go ahead and get prepared, uh, the insurance companies will like you. Uh, and of course, the insurance companies, once you're a client, they'll help you remain uh, a, a better risk. Uh, finally, we'll talk a few resources and then open it up for questions. But as I said, if there's something that I, uh, is a burning issue, uh, go ahead and put it in the, the Q&A. So what is the world look like today? Well, it's another record year. I, it's start, starting to sound like a broken record and vinyl is coming back, right? Um, but they're expecting uh, over $2 trillion in cyber losses around the globe, which is a big number when you consider that that's bigger than many economies of countries in the, in the world. Um, big thing happening is phishing and spear phishing, which if these terms aren't uh, things you know about, we'll talk a little bit more about them. Um, but one of the things that's new in 22 and 23 is because so many of us are working from home or working off of uh, our smartphones, the uh, cyber criminals are starting to realize a great way to reach us is through our phones. Um, and then ransomware is becoming more frequent and unfortunately becoming more expensive. So we'll talk about what you can do to make sure that if you do get hit, you can recover quickly um, and some of the things you can do to avoid uh, getting hit in the first place. So what is this phishing? Uh, phishing is um, a word that talks about, like advertisement, cyber criminals send out thousands or perhaps even millions of emails or texts hoping that some people will fall for it. Um, it used to be that you had to know something to do this, but now you can actually get phishing as a service. So if you are wanting to get into the business of cybercrime, you can help them and they can design for you a phishing campaign. They can give you customer support. They can provide custom payloads. And what this means for us as the victims, potential victims, is that we have to be more and more cautious about what we click on when we're on our phones or on uh, our laptops or tablets. So we've all heard about um, the Russian crime scene. And unfortunately, it's true that 70% of the spear phishing that's being seen around the world today is uh, coming from Russian actors. Um, why? Well, we think partly because they are not being very well um, stopped. Uh, they don't have the kind of FBI like we have that will shut people down if you try and do this sort of thing. So ransomware is on the rise. And in fact, today I noticed um, a, a new thing that's attacking where uh, people are being, instead of encrypting your hard drive or deleting files, they're lurking in your network trying to uh, steal information. Well, I received this email, it was directed to me, and it says, we'll provide you $450 if you qualify and you wanna do a 30 minute online video. Um, it was going out to staff and faculty in higher education, so it sounded like me. It looks very professional. SIS International Research uh, out of New York, London. But when you look at the link, it says Survey Monkey. And I noticed, well, that's weird um, because Survey Monkey is spelled with an A. So as I blew it up, I realized they misspelled Survey. And when I looked at Click Here to Stop Receiving Emails, it goes to the exact same URL or a domain page. So that was a clear indicator that this was not a, a, a benevolent uh, request to talk to me. So that could have easily uh, led to uh, malware on my machine. So what about small business and why, are, why do we care? As a small business, we, we can't always uh, afford 
to recover from an attack. If I'm a large business, um, I have help and I have a big uh, revenue stream so I can afford to do it. But 60% of small businesses who suffer a cyber attack are out of business within six months. Now that's a pretty grim statistic. And so we don't want to be part of that 60%. Uh, we want to be part of the people that don't get attacked at all. But the truth of the matter is that most everyone will get attacked at some point. The question is, how will you recover? And the thing that's odd is that many of those attacks uh, no longer require malware. That means it's not about getting something like a virus or some sort of thing like that, but rather it's a hands-on activity where you clicked on the wrong thing. And if you're one of those 35% of small business that have no security planning, then you may want to, uh, after this presentation, start to look at what can you do to make yourself uh, more secure. So this might be a good time uh, to try and take a poll and find out what groups people are in because um, we as small businesses, we might have point of sales, we might have a phones that we answer, uh, we have email, we have a website, we have customer database. If you could say which of these best describe your industry and what size you are, then this will help us as we go about uh, talking today and see if we can't address some of those areas. Uh, for instance, it, the uh, risk is very different depending on the sector that you're in, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So I might just take a short pause, and uh, you can go ahead and uh, fill that out so we can see uh, what types of businesses are on the line today, and what are the different sizes uh, that we have. You can see the little um, uh, pop-up in front of you. And John, we while we're waiting, John, while we're waiting for um, everyone to answer the poll, um, just if you have questions, enter them in the chat. John, would you like to take? There is a comment in the uh, chat right now, or would you like to hold those for a little bit further into the presentation? Oh no, we can take a, a chat. Let's see. Yeah. It says, um, what does lurking in your network mean, and how do we protect ourselves from them getting our info? Okay, lurking in the network means that. There's a piece of software that is running on either a laptop or a computer uh, that is on your network. Um, so if you have one or two or three computers in your small office, one of those computers uh, could be infected and it would effectively be listening to all of the traffic, the email, the texts, uh, and that information, and it could be then sending that information out to the attackers where they could either use the information against you or sell your information. Uh, the only way that we can discover that is if we have something that looks for incident response inside of our network, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So we have today um, uh, education, finance are the leading uh, groups. Uh, we have construction, healthcare, retail, and then um, most of them are other. In other words, we didn't quite capture the sector uh, that best fits what you're doing. Uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and, and reflect on, on that uh, as we go along. So thanks everyone for um, uh, participating. And um, most people uh, have between one and five employees. Um, and we have uh, just a couple of uh, people that are 50 or more. Uh, that's about uh, a sixth uh, of the group are, are large enough to really be concerned about uh, the security. So that's great sampling. And so we'll address these uh, different sizes and different sectors. Thanks for uh, participating in that poll. Let's see, I'm gonna move this out of the way. Great. Uh, so as we look, um, one of the statistics in the United States is that 57% say that they're financially ill-prepared uh, in the event of, of a cyber uh, incident. Um, and 43% are somewhat 
or well prepared. And that's great if you are in that category. Um, although it's unlikely uh, with the uh, folks that are on this call that um, very many are in that 43%. Uh, and so today's talk is really a geared toward what can we do to be one of those well prepared companies. And what does it mean to be prepared? And how do you determine readiness at, at all? Well, first of all, do you have a plan? And a plan typically consists of some various uh, elements. Uh, the first one is what's key to you? What's important to protect? Your point of sales, uh, your customer database, uh, your, your website, maybe you have a Facebook account, uh, Maybe you have a, an important customer database uh, that you want to protect, or you're in uh, the financial services or legal, in which case you actually have an obligation uh, to protect uh, that customer private information. Uh, but what about, um, uh, what about controls? Because somebody asked about, well, how do I know if there's somebody in my network? If you don't have controls in place, then you won't be able to tell. Um, can you detect whether somebody has compromised you? Uh, can you have a response ready? Do you know who to call? Um, if you have a problem, you know we know about 911, but who do we call in the event of having some problem? Uh, for instance, if you have suspect somebody has stolen your identity, you want to call the Federal Trade Commission. And uh, they're the people that you can report that to. And how easy is it to return to normal operations? These are all questions to ask, but even if you can answer all these, you may still want cybersecurity insurance. So everyone is out there being hit. So this is from informationisbeautiful.net and it shows very large organizations, but what they don't talk about is that there are many, many attacks on small organizations today, they just don't make it. You see their, their tiny little dots on this uh, graph, uh, whereas the big ones uh, matter. But if you're a Facebook customer, you have to be concerned because um, half a billion Facebook accounts were compromised uh, in 2022. And that means that yours might have been compromised. And it's good to know because you may uh, want to change your Facebook uh, password uh, from what it was if you have a personal and a business Facebook. So what can we do to get started with cyber insurance and why might you want cyber insurance? Well, first of all, cyber insurance marketplace has grown to being $13 billion and they measure it in the premiums they receive. Uh, that doesn't tell you the amount that they would return in the event of a problem. But there are more insurers in the marketplace, including um, about 25, 20% uh, of the marketplace is really geared towards small businesses. Um, but one of the things that we saw during the pandemic is that there was a large price hike uh, compared to 2018, 2019, when cyber insurance was relatively young because the insurance companies have realized, uh-oh, we can't afford to insure people that are risky clients. So some of the risky clients include K through 12 organizations. I noticed there were people on uh, the call that were from education and remarkably small local governments. Uh, so towns and cities that aren't, aren't very big um, are risky because the criminal thinks they're good targets to attack and they don't necessarily have the resources uh, to build up their uh, cybersecurity portfolio. So when you look out at cyber insurance, you should know that there's really a couple of different parts. The first one is called first party. That means your business, your systems, your data that's lost. Uh, whereas a third party is suppose that some customer um, feels that you uh, mishandled their information and they want to uh, go after you because they lost something from the attack. For instance, they were exploited or somehow they got caught up, not because of them, but because they were your customer and uh, your, your attack, your risk 
uh, bled over to them. Finally, one of the things that can happen, I think probably all of you have some sort of business owner uh, insurance policy. It's practically required in business today. And you can oftentimes talk to your current insurance company and find out, do you have a cyber insurance writer um, on my current business policy? And what does it cover? And what doesn't it cover? Uh, because it's important to know what you have. And oftentimes your existing uh, policy uh, company will be the best place to start uh, with uh, cyber insurance planning. So what can it help? Well, we talked about phishing. That's uh, one particular type of what's called social engineering. And a social engineering means I'm tricking you into sending money to an, an imposter. Now, we've all heard about this, and I know some of us maybe laugh about it, where somebody says, what? The IRS called up and wanted some Target gift cards to pay my, my, my IRS bill? Believe it or not, some people uh, fall for things like this. And when that happens, uh, that money's gone. Uh, but what the insurance coverage will do is reimburse the funds that were lost due to this um, social engineering. Uh, provided you um, have that coverage. And of course, you may have a deductible, which would uh, take away from the amount that you received. Um, now, ransomware is one that we talked about. That's where you click on something. And because of that, it locks up your data. Um, oftentimes, it does that by encrypting the data and you don't get the key. And then what comes up on your screen is please send us Bitcoin or fractions of a Bitcoin, and we will return your data to you so that uh, you can continue running. And in some cases, people are told, well, don't pay that ransom. But of course, if you have a business that must be operating, sometimes paying that ransom um, is more expedient, especially if you don't have uh, backups. In some cases, we can't pay the ransom. It's not legal to pay the, the ransom. Um, so we'll, um, we'll look at what that could happen. But the insurance coverage would cover that ransom, the cost, in excess of your deductible. So let's say they asked you to send $1,000. Um, and so your insurance company pays the $1,000 but you owe them 500 because your deductible is $500. That's just an example. So it helps you uh, to get back on track. And most of the time, uh, the, the uh, cyber criminals will unlock your data, but there have been times when they haven't even been able to unlock the data. So we wanna be prepared to recover even without paying the ransom. Now, with financial things, you might have, uh, fraud and funds being transferred. I know that uh, uh, someone I know uh, lost information by using their debit card. And unfortunately that meant they were able to drain their entire uh, credit, their entire account that was connected to that debit card. So I always remind people, use your credit card because then you're liable only up to $50 uh, uh, annually. Uh, network interruption, this is where somebody might attack your network and prevent people from being able to do business with you. And you'll notice in this case, you can only get reimbursed the lost profit. So let's say you make $1,000 a day normally in profit, um, then you're out for two days, you could be reimbursed for that $2,000 that you normally would have made as profit. Um, but this is, again, a very important reason why you have to keep your finances up to date so that you can prove that, in fact, you had business loss uh, from that outage. These are just examples, and there's many more. Um, and we'll talk about some of the things as we go through. So we have a variety of people on the line from construction, education, finance, um, health. And some of those areas are are not regulated. In other words, restaurants, hotels, some of these customer information and website is not regulated by any uh, sort of uh, legislation. Uh, 
So it's up to the sector or the company to decide how much security uh, and reporting that they need to do. Whereas some areas like legal, financial, health, uh, they have the rules, many of us have heard of HIPAA for the, for the health uh, regulations, and it helps say how much PII, and PII stands for um, private information, and that personally identifiable information could be your social security, your address, your date of birth, your age, all of this stuff that you don't want publicly available because with that public information, somebody could pretend to be you or open up credit or they could sell that record of information for money on the uh, internet today. And in many cases, communication with clients is restricted in the legal, financial and health industry so that uh, it's not shared and can't be lost. This is the reason that you can't use email uh, for much communication in the uh, financial or health industry because email is not secure. Um, it can be um, captured if you're not uh, very careful. So cyber insurance is just one leg of your cybersecurity stance. Uh, I mentioned you need to identify what you can't do business without because cybersecurity is not about black and white. There's no such thing as perfect security, but there's no reason for you to be insecure either. And so we need to evaluate what is the risk to your business and what is the cost to get prepared uh, so that you could uh, go ahead and be in a better position. There's the old joke about being out with uh, people in the woods and you don't have to be faster than the bear, you just have to be faster than the slowest person that's close to the bear, right? Well, the bear is the cyber criminal. And what we wanna do is make it so you're not leaving your doors unlocked, your car unlocked, your windows unlocked. We want to do the equivalent thing in cyberspace so that you, are not seen as an easy target uh, for these criminals. So how do we evaluate your business? How do you decide what to do? And then finally, really, how do you harden so that you are not one of the targets? Uh, so we'll go through and we'll look at some of the key areas that small businesses and individuals, because let's face it, uh, many small businesses rely on just a few people in the organization to know what's going on uh, from a computer and an IT point of view. And if you don't have them on board, uh, then you could be a, a soft target. Now, luckily there's been a lot of work on this. Uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology provides a lot of resources and tools to help you walk through the steps to identify what's important, to decide what kind of protections you need, to be able to detect in case something happens, how to respond and finally how to recover. So luckily here in, the, in Arizona, we also have a lot of companies that can help with a small business and we are improving with the, the SBDC and others um, to be able to provide services that can help uh, you in, in, uh, in moving forward in this area. So insurance providers use all these acronyms and in the world of cybersecurity and actually in every discipline, people make up all these three letter acronyms. Look at this, EDR, MFA, IM, PM. What the heck are all these things and how do I respond? Because the insurance provider has a questionnaire and they say, um, do you have any of these things implemented? And you look at that and you go, I, I don't even know what these things mean. So we'll walk through and make English out of these things so that you can decide whether or not you are prepared or not. And what steps can you take to be more prepared? So endpoint detection, what does that mean? Well, one part of endpoint detection is to have antivirus. Uh, so some of these words you may know about, if you're running Microsoft, they have built into it what's called the Microsoft Defender. 
Uh, you may have heard of malware bytes. It, there's a free version as well as a paid version. And some of these others, Bitdefender, Sophos, um, allow you to monitor your devices and can help detect if something goes wrong. And that means uh, you can then be warned that something happens. If you have antivirus, you probably notice that sometimes uh, you'll get a little pop-up says, we've discovered something, what do you wanna do about it? And you can quarantine it or delete it or ignore it. Um, I, I usually recommend don't continuously ignore it for very long because it could really be something to consider. Uh, so you can find out by looking at these, um, there's even open source called open EDR so that that's uh, quote unquote free, but of course uh, it means that it doesn't have the kind of support that these other companies provide to the small business. Another one that the insurance company asks you is MFA, multi-factor authentication. Well, we're kind of getting used to this because many of our banks now ask us when we log in, we also have to get a six digit code on our cell phone to be able to get access to our bank account. This is an example of two factor authentication. And by having something you are, biometrics, your fingerprint, your voice, your face, uh, something you know, the password, um, or a token, or something you have. In some cases, uh, banks provide you a little token that uh, will give you a, um, a little key to be able to access. I know it used to be um, uh, Wells Fargo was using a token to be able to access my business account. Now, this is a critical one um, because people are not always the best at backing up their data. So what is your strategy? There's automatic services. For instance, this little one called Crash Plan uh, can be set up for a small business at a relatively inexpensive monthly cost, and it will back up every single system on your network. And it backs it up so that if something were to go wrong, you could recover the data on your own. You don't even have to call someone up. You just go and click a few things and you can recover that data from where it's stored. You can also use something like an external drive, but if you do that, you have to remember to one, remove it after you back it up and you have to have a, a very dedicated way of doing that every night, back up your data. If something goes wrong, you're only one day away from your old information. And this is critical for ransomware remediation. That means if you were for some reason to be subject to ransomware, you can always just say, well, uh, I'm okay because I have a backup strategy. My data is secure and I can put the data back after I clean the computer off and I'll be a backup and running in a matter of potentially hours or at most a day uh, if you know what to do. Let's see, if somebody asked whether the PowerPoint is gonna be available. I know we are recording uh, this information um, and we can uh, certainly send out a, uh, a PDF of this uh, presentation, but you can get it on the uh, video uh, as well. And John, we had another question. Uh, does Embry okay. University offer student internships? So students can look or advise small business, small company security system? Yes, uh, in fact, um, Amber Riddle does have uh, internships and summer workers. And uh, we have been working with the state of Arizona, for instance, uh, to be able to provide support to small businesses. And we're hoping to expand that to towns and cities uh, all around the state. Um, but not just Embry Riddle. I'm working with a uh, a consortium of institutions so that we can have uh, these kinds of young and talented experts uh, to be resources for our community because we'd like Arizona to be known as a cyber secure state 
and a great place to do business because of all of our talent. So one of the three letter uh, acronyms was I am, I A M. Uh, and that stands for identity and access management. Um, well, what's the big deal about identity? You know, people think, well, of course the computer knows who I am, but really the computer doesn't. The computer only knows what you type into it. And so if somebody gets your credentials, that is your username and password, the computer thinks it's you. Uh, so as a small business, you have to make sure that the identification and credentials that you give to everybody that has access to your uh, systems is real. And you have to enforce not sharing of credentials. So it may take a little bit more work to uh, have uh, different credentials for each person, but that's the only way that you're able to really be secure. And of course, you're the one that knows whether uh, you know, that person is Sam, really Sam. Um, and once you have the ID, you can say, well, what can you do? What files can you access? Don't give everybody access to everything um, because there's no need for the person in accounts payable to know about your uh, engineering drawings. Uh, so by separating the access, you have lower risk if something were to be compromised. And then you want to know that there are things called privileged accounts. And privileged accounts are people that have access to a lot of different things, your database, uh, your point of sale system. And they're important because they help administer things. But unfortunately, if their account is compromised, your entire system is compromised. Now, I always ask people, how many of you on your computer uh, are both the user and the administrator? In Microsoft World, the administrator has privilege to add files, delete files, add programs, delete programs, very powerful. But no, not everyone should be an administrator. And in fact, most of the time, you should not even be an administrator. So how can you do that? Well, you can create a separate users on your personal computers. Because if you have a computer that is shared by many people, you can have a separate account called administrator. But when you log out of administrator, you log, log back in as staff or whatever you want to call it. And you put in a nice password like this one. I know I won't forget this long password. Um, and by having good passwords and separating the duties between administrator and user, you are less likely to be harmed in case something goes wrong. So um, you, of course, have a different password for administrator and staff, because otherwise you've just defeated the whole purpose of having separation of duty. Now, do you manage your passwords? Because how many passwords do you have? And how many times do you have to reset your password because you haven't kept track of your passwords? And do you write the passwords down? Uh, do you have them on a sticky note uh, next to the computer? Um, you'd be surprised at how many people uh, aren't really managing their passwords very well. There's another website uh, at Information is Beautiful where it shows the uh, 5,000 most common passwords. And believe it or not, there is a website where you can go to find the 10 million most common passwords. And you say, why in the world would somebody want to do that? Well, if they breach somebody like Facebook, they can find the passwords in an encrypted form, but then by doing an attack, they can discover the passwords and the username that is usually the email address. And if you use that same password from Facebook for say your bank account, that's bad news because then they can try and get in. So I always recommend password managers, even though you may have heard in the news that LastPass was compromised, but what was compromised um, was the ability to see an old version of some of the passwords, but that still didn't give access to the ones that were shared in the, inside 
for your banking account, for your Amazon, for your point of sales, all those are using strong encryption and can't be easily attacked um, like the um, uh, main password. Of course, it does mean that all of the people that had LastPass were told, go and change your master password right away. You can get both cloud-based and local storage option uh, password managers. And I think that this is a great way since most of us now have 50 passwords that we have to manage uh, from all of the different websites and options that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, how many of you are keeping up to date with your antivirus, your app applications, your operating system? They warn you and they say, oh, there's an update. You have the option to make your updates automatic. And for antivirus, um, it's important from my point of view to set them on automatic uh, because the antivirus companies share threats and typically they change their antivirus and anti-malware daily. And so by doing that on an automatic fashion, you just drip the new information to your computer and you're able to stay more secure. And you would think that these large companies keep up to date with applications and operating system, but they don't. Just recently, uh, over 20,000 companies were attacked because of a two year old vulnerability. And it costs millions of dollars uh, to protect them. Now we talked about think before you click, phishing, spear phishing and whaling. Phishing is like advertisement. It's repeated to everybody. And the most common uh, phishing attacks are from PayPal, uh, Amazon, FedEx, not because these companies are vulnerable, but because almost everyone in the world, uh, everyone in the United States anyway, um, has bought something from Amazon, has had something delivered by FedEx. And so when you receive an email or a text that says, oh, you have a FedEx uh, shipment, uh, do you wanna change the location of, of the drop? And you go, well, that's weird. They've never had this for me to before. Don't believe it because typically you'll see something very different, but they're getting better and better at imitating these other companies because they can scrape the logo. They can go ahead and look at what an actual message from FedEx looks like and they make it look just like them. However, if you're very careful, you'll notice that the number that they ask you to call or the URL, that is the domain name, the link that they want you to follow, doesn't look like a normal FedEx link. Well, don't fall for it. Instead, go to your FedEx account and go to the real FedEx website and go and look at your tracking number. Or, or with PayPal, they say you've got an invoice and if you don't respond, the invoice is going to be paid out of your account. Well, I don't have an account then don't click on it. Spear phishing is one where it's directed precisely at you and it says, uh, John, uh, your boss wants to talk to you and they've got my boss's name correct. They've got my address. Where did they get all this information? Well, from the internet because all this information is available and they make it look like it's urgent. You need to send me something right now. Click this link. And whaling is when they attack the CEO of your organization or, or the chief financial officer. And that might be you. And they're going to know that because you're so busy, you may not notice that they are directing this information at you. So here's this example of a FedEx. Have you ever seen a FedEx number 5935? No. FedEx always has like, I don't know, 13 digits long uh, number. They say, we've got a message for you. And if you look at the click where they want you to click, you hover over it with your mouse. What do you see? It looks like something that doesn't look at all like FedEx. What is this? En-soul.net, WP content, bowling web. And the two places, click here and view messages, go to the same spot. 
That's very suspicious. So don't fall for it. Now, some of you may have seen this one. Uh-oh, we've been watching you. We are on your computer right now. As I said, lurking in your network. Pay us $300 or we're gonna expose you to family and friends. And here's proof because this is one of your passwords. And you look at that password, Neil three time. Uh-oh, that is one of my passwords. Well, how in the world did they get that password? Well, they got it from one of those breaches. That might've been a password that you used on Facebook at one time. Maybe it's not your current password, but it might've been one. So you recognize it. And so you think, oh my gosh, these guys are, are telling the truth. They know about my password. Don't fall for it. Because um, they're hoping you're gonna click on the link and you are gonna tell them your password. So this is uh, an example. And they might know you by name. Where did they get your name? Again, off of LinkedIn or Facebook or off of your company directory. There's so many ways to get important information about all of us. And if you think about it, try this. Google your name and see what happens. You'll be surprised. And never re-enter your credentials. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, you get an information and they say, please put in your username and password. You go, why should I do that? This doesn't make sense because they're trying to harvest your credentials. So don't fall for it. Here I have something, it looks like it's coming from the National Exchange Bank and it's, it directs me individually, it says, Dear John, uh, please confirm your identity and look at this, what they try and trick you. We value you as a client and will never ask for your social security number. Well, of course they won't. Uh, and they're just putting this in there to make you think that it's official, but they hope that you'll actually put in your real username and password for the National Exchange Bank and Trust. But this isn't really from them, it's from someone else. So if you are a client, they don't need you. You can always call up your bank or this other organization and say, did, did you send me an, a notice? Do you need something from me? And the bank will of course say, no. If you want something from us, we're too busy. We're not gonna reach out to you. So you gotta be careful with these, especially if it's a Dear John letter. Um, so to be more secure, this is a kind of a summary I call it basic cyber hygiene. Uh, use multi-factor authentication, especially for your financial operations. Separate your user accounts, do strong passwords. Stay updated, back up, think before you click and don't share your credentials. And if you just follow these basic and simple rules, then you are well ahead of 95% or more of the risks to your small company. So this is, will also make you uh, more insurable. So some little resources, uh, your insurance broker, like you probably have an insurance company already or a broker. So for instance, VIP insurance professionals, they work with many different insurance companies and you might have already a brokerage or a company, contact them. Go to your small business insurance, an example, Hiscox. There's many others, but go to them, talk to them. Uh, NIST, I mentioned the cybersecurity framework. If you just Google NIST cybersecurity framework, you'll find information. And here in the United States now, we have an organization called CISA, and they are trying to help small businesses. Why? Because they are the backbone of the United States job growth, and they are the most at-risk and most likely not to have the kinds of professionals that can help. So I'm gonna kind of wrap up here with uh, some uh, questions and uh, you can reach me at uh, john at centerfuture.org um, if uh, you wanna follow up and um, look forward to some questions. I see one right here. How about using a VPN? Are they secure? Well, a VPN, which stands for Virtual Private Network, is a great thing uh, to help you if, for instance, you're at a coffee shop, you're at an airport, uh, you're at a hotel, and you don't want 
to be running your laptop or your phone or your tablet on their network because you don't know about the security. In fact, what you do know is that it's not secure because they give out the password at the coffee shop. Mycoffeeshop.secure is the name of the password. Well, that means that everyone in that coffee shop for the last month has that same password to get onto their webs, uh, their, their Wi-Fi. So the virtual private network allows you to have a, what's called a secure tunnel uh, while you are on that Wi-Fi network. But it doesn't protect you uh, from some types of threats. Uh, if you're on a VPN and you still click on a, um, a phishing uh, attack, it doesn't care that your network connection is secure. Um, it's still going to grab the information that you type in. Hope that helps. Uh, what are the ramifications if someone's identity is breached? Well, there's always the horror stories. Um, I know uh, a gal that has been working for nearly two years to clean up her credit report, and um, she gets calls from bill collectors. Um, she has a hard time getting her credit scores back because somebody uh, pretended to be them by getting their information. They opened up accounts, they bought things that they couldn't afford, and it seems like the real person with the real name is saddled with all of these bad debts. So that's the horror story that can occur. And that's why if you think you've been breached, you uh, the Federal Trade Commission, FTC, has a website where you can go and there's a phone number. I don't have it right off the top of my head, but if you Google FTC uh, identity theft, you will find the resource there uh, to be able to help you uh, in the event that you suspect identity theft. Um, your banks and uh, credit and others have the ability to do what's called locking your credit and you can then relatively easily unlock it when you want to do something real like purchase a home or get a loan. You unlock your, your credit, um, you do the job of applying, and then you lock it back up. So these are some of the things that are capable uh, for people to use today. Let's see if there's other questions. I might've missed some. I think we had a question in the Q&A, um, make sure we... Sure. How much risk is there to retailers that offer open Wi-Fi access to customers? Well, the retailer um, them yourself, um, as long as you've done a good job of creating uh, the Wi-Fi and the Wi-Fi is not connected to your systems. This is critical. If you wanna offer Wi-Fi, then have a separate channel for the customers. And so that, that your uh, systems, your customer database, your point of sales is not connected to that same Wi-Fi uh, because otherwise they're on your network. And that means that they can be fooling around and you might not even be aware of it. So that's one risk. Um, if you were to offer an open Wi-Fi to folks, you might want to have a little uh, sheet that you say, this is an open Wi-Fi, um, be alert, this is not secure, we're offering it as a convenience to you, we are not uh, saying that this is secure. And then that way um, you are uh, mitigating some of your risk. In the United States, unfortunately, um, anyone can still give you a hard time if they think that something has happened because of you. Um, so, John, I see we're down to our last five minutes. How oh, okay. If I share my screen. And, yeah, sure. Um, there is an, an additional question in the Q&A. Esmeralda, maybe you could share that while I'm bringing up my screen so we can kind of close out our session today. Sure. And thanks for having me, um, uh, Paula and Esmeralda. Thank you.
Um, so it is quite a lengthy uh, paragraph. So uh, they did provide some context and it says someone in our, in our small family business was fooled into allowing a hacker into a person's computer under the guise of helping with a screen lock that was a result of clicking on a bad URL. The person realized that something had gone awry while the hacker, hacker had access to that person's computer and shut the computer down. There was some, uh, is it PII? info or p2 yeah personally identifiable information okay and the information uh on the computer very few actually um so the question is what's the likelihood of some of that uh personal person pii <laughs> pii would be found for sale in the dark web besides changing passwords and run, running virus detection what else can i do to protect our business <laughs> You, you you could uh, go ahead and, and purchase um, uh, an inexpensive one month uh, scan of the dark web uh, if you know what you're looking for. Like for instance, suppose that you know uh, these names, uh, then you can go ahead and, and pay for that. It doesn't cost very much to do it for a month, and if doesn't anything doesn't come up, then you could just take the risk because the odds are relatively low if there wasn't very much on there. Thank you, John. Yeah, thank you. Paula, you're muted. Paula, you're still on mute. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Esmeralda. All right. Thank you, John, for being with us today to share all of your expertise on cybersecurity. I know we could, we could keep going. There's so much of uh, important information out there. But the good news is we do have some additional upcoming cybersecurity sessions. June 7th, we will be talking about e-commerce and data protection and July 19th, simple solutions to common threats. And of course the SBDC is here, as I mentioned at the top of the hour uh, for no fee one-on-one -on -one counseling. And you see the link there on the screen. So please feel free to reach out to us and register for our upcoming events. Esmeralda will be sending out a survey for this client training. So please complete the survey. We want to hear your feedback about this and other topics of interest to you and your business. And also um, we'll be sending out um, John's short list of um, next step actions you can take and some additional resources related to cybersecurity for your small business. So look for that coming for those participating in our session today. Thank you all again. And again, thank you, John and uh, Esmeralda. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.